Listen. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nintendo Voice Chat. I am your temporary host, Tom Marks, uh, filling in today for episode 478, getting close to that big 500 Uh-oh. up there. Uh, filling in for Casey DeFritas, your regular host, who's uh, just out and about, very busy this week, heading places, getting on planes, doing important stuff. But I'm joined this week by Janet Garcia. Hey. Mr. Brian Altano. Hello. And a very short Zach Ryan. Chat. Lil Zachy. <laughs> I'm trying out shouting chat at the beginning of the episodes like they do on Scoop or Beyond. Even what do though, you guys think? Even oh. Chat. Oh, I oh. see. I thought you were like calling out to a Twitch chat that didn't exist. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I hated it at first, but it's already grown on me. I think it leads to confusion, <laughs> so I'm okay with it. Oh, right. my goodness. Well, uh, we've got a Griff show for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about just some news that's going on. They announced a very cute pony for... Uh, for uh, Pokemon, that's people very good. in this office lost their minds over that small horse. Yep. Pretty much, yeah. my little uh, Pokemon. We're yeah. also going to be talking about what the next gen. My little Pokemon is very good. Very I missed good. that. Yeah. Thank wow. you. Uh, we're going to be talking about what next gen means for uh, Nintendo in after the announcement of the PlayStation Five, and kind of contextualize what that means in Nintendo's world and the Switch and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but first, we want to do a really quick. Uh, correction from something we talked about last week on the show. We discussed how in a Game Informer interview, the Pokemon company said that there would be 18 gyms in Pokemon Sword and Shield. That is basically the Game Informer came out and after Game Freak corrected them that this was based on a mistranslation, miscommunication, something along those lines. You know, interviews between languages always get uh, they get wires crossed, so it's understandable. There are going to be 18 gyms that exist in this world, but each game only has eight gyms as normal, uh, and you will get some gyms in that, and we already know that the gyms are going to differ between the games somewhat, but we don't know how, and we don't know the details of that. So it is still eight gyms, not 18. 18 is this other thing where there's like 18 in the universe, or it, it's a that little math confusing. doesn't check out. There must be like one bonus gym in each. Well, they also talked about minor league gyms that are sort of this side thing, so it might be that, you know, could that's, be set that's dressing part of it. It could be set dressing. Like, it's, it's, it's unclear, but the actual collecting badges, there will be eight gyms that you go through, not 18. So... That's just a little update from last week. Uh, let- Saved like 60 hours. So there we go. <laughs> yeah, they, it's true, actually. Goodness gracious. Guides riders the world over rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's move on, though, and start with some news today, because there's not actually a ton of news to go through. I wanted to, to start off, though, with that Pokemon glint that we, uh, that we saw in everyone's eyes. The Galarian Ponyta was announced, and it was revealed through potentially one of the most ridiculous reveal methods uh, I've seen in a video game announcement, which was a 24-hour live stream of a forest where nothing happened, except occasionally you'd get a glimpse of a Pokemon. Uh, and somebody cut this 24-hour video down into just the moments where things happened, and it was seven minutes <laughs> A hero. Long. Yeah. Uh, so they did announce Galarian Ponyta. What do you guys... What do you, Zach, you were just shaking your head a lot. What do you think about this? Well, I was shaking my head because that is a ridiculous way to reveal any sort of characters, but it's right. very like true to Pokemon and very true to Nintendo, I feel like. Uh, I like the idea of like, here's just a window into this like real space mm-hmm. where, you know, maybe a new Pokemon will wander across. But I was also shaking my head because there's only one person in the world that watched all 24 hours of that stream, and it was Casey DeFridis. So, yeah. Hey, I, I might give a second place to Miranda. Yeah. You never know. But, yeah. <laughs> I just feel like all day on, on Twitter, I was seeing Casey like update with like screenshots of like, what is this? Who is that? Oh, God. Yeah. Really good. I was involved in those conversations. Yeah. And it was it was kind of fun. Like it was, I, I agree with you where it's a cool concept and the execution isn't quite as exciting as the idea of like, oh, you're fully immersed in the Pokemon world. You're right. watching the stream that Sonia set up, who's the uh, professor's assistant. Um, but yeah, in practice, it was kind of dull, but I kind of liked how ridiculous it was. It gave us something to talk about and bond over. And I feel like it was a good representation of how overly excited and granular like that fan base is. And like as someone that does like Pokemon, but maybe isn't like there's levels to Pokemon love. Um, I'm not sure where I land on that scale, but I liked it was nice to like have everyone have that one ridiculous conversation for like a long period of time. So yeah. there was something kind of fun about and it. And Casey chimed into our planning doc to mention that she actually really liked this live stream because it did give something for the community to sort of rally mm-hmm. around. Like the the whole community was just basically they were just really excited about the whole thing, and it was it was cool that people got to talk about it and speculate and do all this silly stuff. With a lot that. of good jokes. I think yeah. I think memes. we all have like a. F- 
our own forests that we would look at for 24 hours. <laughs> for our, like, I think, That's like, if you were, man. like, if you said this for, like, Metroid, you're, like, we're just putting up a Metroid forest, and every, like, four hours, like, you see a glimpse of, like, Samus's arm, I'd be, like, That's stupid. And then I would just watch the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Tell us what your forest is, guys. Yeah. I want to know. What is, yeah, what my, is your my forest? mind forest? Yeah. It's probably like a Zelda. Your wishing Zelda. hole or whatever. Yeah. That makes more sense than a Metroid forest. Yeah. <laughs> If you're asking, if you're asking the question, how do we personally feel about this character reveal mm -hmm. and not just the stream? I don't care. <laughs> Ouch. I don't care. I just want this game to come out. I'm tired of talking about it. Let's go. Well, so like the horse. real quick, a little info: the, came Galer the wrong Galarian show. Ponyta. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Galarian Ponyta is essentially the foil to Surfetched, which we got. Surfetched is sword exclusive. Galarian Ponyta Let me is my shield previous statement. exclusive. Love Surfetched. Yeah, yeah. very into mm -hmm. Surfetched. He's great. Yeah. I actually hate horses when they're pretty. I like it when really? they're weird. He loves like, 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 real ugly like, horses. Bones out, like yeah. ugly horse. Yeah, yeah. Like, horse from, from right. Breath of the Wild. Mm -hmm. I love the Breath of the Wild yeah. skeleton horse. That's skeleton like horse my favorite. Uh, <laughs> Somebody animated the story I told on that show. Of, yeah, this, on the show of like that my horse exploding, and that's like one of my favorite moments in Zelda history. Mm -hmm. It's my forest. <laughs> that's his. So that's that's not, his but this non-exploding horse has something else going on. Uh, the Galarian Ponyta is a psychic type. Everyone mm -hmm. was assuming fairy. Uh, Casey also wanted me to call out that it's got a new unique ability called Pastel Veil, uh, which prevents it and teammates from getting poisoned and also clears off poison when it comes in, which uh, apparently is a very big deal. I'm not a like competitive Pokemon player, but apparently that's a pretty powerful move because it is essentially a hard counter to any teams where their whole strategy is poison and then turtle up and let the poison deal the damage. This Pokemon just completely stops that strategy because it just completely prevents poison. So uh, it's not only like a pretty cute mm -hmm. thing that the community got excited about, but it's also something that the competitive scene is apparently talking about a little bit because it it presents things that were not available in the game before, and and that's that's pretty exciting. That's cool. Yeah, and I always think it's really awesome when they introduce either a new Pokemon or a new form that has an ability that's also just new to the series in general. Right. Like, this is something that is completely new to Pokemon, and it's always cool when those additions come in because that's really going to change, like, not just the competitive space, but how people strategize, how people build their teams, uh, what Pokemon people attach to in a more practical sense, other than just the fact that it is a gorgeous-looking horse. <laughs> it's a very cute unicorn. Yeah. Uh, moving on to something... Much more gruff and intense. Yeah, let's talk about the man game. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Big boy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doom Eternal got delayed to 2020 this week. Which Hardcore is, delays. Which is a yeah. bummer, but it's also not necessarily like a super long wait. Yeah. No, uh, it's I March. Think, well, I, it might be longer for Nintendo. So this is the main yeah. thing. Yeah. It went from... Uh, Excuse me, it was I, end of November, I believe mm -hmm. it was. Like mm -hmm. the November 22nd. Now it's March 20th. Mm -hmm. uh, but... It was supposed to launch on Switch simultaneously, and now the Switch version is coming after it launches on other systems at some undisclosed time. We don't know when. Which is probably for the best. Like, I, I know this is two completely separate audiences, but putting that game out on the same day as Animal Crossing right. is like maybe not entirely detrimental to Doom's strategy, but it's also like hardcore Nintendo fans are probably all in on Animal Crossing. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's a significant portion of that audience that is only going to allot the cash for one game in that window, and it's not going to be Doom. So I think yeah. if the game has to be delayed, holding it for Switch is maybe not the worst idea. I'm struggling to find like any semblance of thematic crossover between those games. Okay, but here's, the thing, but here's the thing. It's like, you're going to play Doom. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm agreeing Animal with you. Crossing. I'm just trying yeah. to figure out if there's anything, any symbolism that actually appears in both games. There's probably funny collectibles in Doom. Yeah. I think collect a lot of stuff in Animal Crossing. Mr. I, Rossetti sort of lives in hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rossetti's not in this game, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, he doesn't have that job in this game. He might still be in this game. Oh, that's fair. That's still fair. be around, yeah. Uh, Hope alive. Brendan, Brendan Graber. I was literally pulling up, yeah. pulling up the tweet. He yep. pulled up, he, he did a, a, a tweet that was like, on March 20th, 2020, what, you, what will you rip and tear? And it was demons or weeds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Smart. Which I think is a really good one. Um, exactly. So that's the connection. Yeah, that is the connection. Uh, additionally, I feel like that dude rips and, weeds every day, if you know what I'm talking about. Whoa, whoa. Uh, additionally, <laughs> one of the... <laughs> One of the things that is also delayed is that okay. they, they said that the uh, multiplayer mode where like some people play as demons and or no, I'm sorry, the ability to like invade other people's games as demons, which yeah. is this feature that they're doing in it. Uh, that is going to be come post launch in a free update as well. So it sounds like the switch delay might not even be just an Animal Crossing consideration, mm -hmm. but it also might be 
uh, that they genuinely need time to finish this game, which is why they've delayed it, and they're kind of seeing like, okay, what can we push post this March 20th date just to give us more time to focus on the core game? Yeah, ho- I think hopefully this doesn't mean that there'll be like a truncated version of Doom for Switch. Like a lot, of, not a lot of times, but sometimes when there are like games that launch on Switch that are a little bit more demanding, they're not as, like, built out feature-wise. So well, hopefully and, it's something And here. potentially that's what would have happened if they did do a simultaneous sure. release, and they're trying to prevent that. I mean, if you look at what they did with the last one, they made the multiplayer mode an optional mm-hmm. download, mm-hmm. Right. which I think is, like, an interesting approach. Um, I think that was super smart. To yeah, I mean, what if they did that for this time around but made it an optional purchase entirely mm-hmm. or dropped the price by removing a mode? Like yeah. giving you just the single player campaign. Yeah, I think by and large, uh, we understand maybe a little bit better that game delays are always, for the most part, for the best. Yeah, um, it's disappointing that Doom is pushed out of uh, 2019 because I was looking forward to talking about Doom in our end of year discussions. But yeah. that's okay. We'll wait ne- until next year. Yeah. Also, yeah. November is just like super packed. There's like Death Stranding, Pokemon, and Star Wars. So yeah, and so but like so is Q1 2020 now. Though, oh yeah, yeah. March, March. Yeah. Is, how did March and true. April and that window get busier? Is just insane. This is, yeah, this is probably like the most densely packed sort of swan song. But in, in 2020, that's future me's problem. So I always <laughs> defer. Now. Future me is gonna like be really on it. So I'm like, that's yeah, that's true. Yeah, November Janet doesn't care at all. Exactly. About those games. The, no. um, the, the final bit of this uh, that got announced up, uh, alongside this delay is that Doom 64 is actually coming to all platforms, and it will be a pre-order bonus for Doom Eternal. So if you do pre-order Doom Eternal, uh, you just get Doom 64 on March 20th. That's cool. So the only thing I hate about that news is that I wish they had just given us Doom 64 on the day that Doom Eternal was supposed to launch. Like having to wait Mm -hmm. until next March to get Doom 64 when it's been done for 40 years feels like (laughs) kind of a waste. Like I'd be be a really good make good to give that to people like next month. This is the interesting thing is it could be a complete remake in the way that the other Dooms were. Because that was something that people discovered is the other Dooms are actually Unity clones. Like Mm -hmm. they remade Doom 1 and Doom 2 when they re-released them in Unity to just be able to re-release it, I guess, easier, or maybe it was cheaper, maybe they didn't have the source code, maybe it was too much difficult to It's insane port. that we live in an era where completely rebuilding a game from the ground up in a different engine is the like cost-effective version yeah, of... Yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it could be that they did just remake this game. We, d- we don't know. Yeah. No, uh, it's I, like I, in, in like filmmaking, it's easier to create a cow in CG than it is to rent one. <laughs> right. I, I think that... like the, To go off of your point, what I would really love... About the cow? Yes, about the cow. (laughs) What I would really love from this particular deal is like, let me order Doom Eternal, pre-order Doom Eternal on my PlayStation 4, but give me the option to choose where my download for Doom 64 is. Yeah. Like, I would love to play Doom 64 on my Switch. I think that'd be a real fun Mm -hmm. throwback, but I'm going to play Doom Eternal on an HD console. Same here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 that's a really good point. I like that. I mean, Kickstarters let you do that, right? Mm -hmm. They sort of like let let you... pick and choose? Yeah, it's sort of piecemeal decide exactly where you want your rewards to go. So, yeah, I dig that. So those are the bigger news things. Uh, some really quick ones to run up through. Uh, Reggie fils was inducted to the International Hall Video Game Hall of Fame with the Lifetime Achievement Award, so congratulations to him. That's very cool. He was cool. also inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which That's I thought true. was weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't believe you. He did the splits. It was crazy. <laughs> World's greatest grandpa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stardew Valley is now fully self-published on Switch, which is something that they've been kind of working towards. It used to be published by Chucklefish, uh, and in the last... I think it was like a year or so, uh, the developer, Eric Brony, has been switching back over to self-publishing on platforms, and now the only place that he's not self-publishing, I believe, is on mobile. Uh, so he's self-publishing on Switch now, which doesn't really mean much for you as an actual game player, but... Uh, it means a lot for him. It means a lot for him, exactly. Um, quick plug for uh, Jason Schreier's book, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, that has a uh, an entire chapter about Stardew Valley, and the development of that game is fascinating oh. mm-hmm. and wild. If you haven't read that book, I highly recommend that... Yeah, that Very excerpt cool. especially, yeah. Uh, another really quick tiny thing is uh, this game got announced today called Murder by Numbers. Yeah. Which I just want to mention because everyone that saw it in the office was basically like, oh my God, this game, because it's pretty much Phoenix Wright, but when you look at a clue, it becomes a Picross puzzle, and you have to solve the Picross puzzle to get the clue, and then you can bring those puzzle frames back into like conversations and be like, I found this evidence. Like real detective. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Pretty much. It's very, very silly. Yeah. Uh, and it looks really, really cool. And 
It's coming out in 2020 on Steam and Switch, and so it's just one to keep an eye out for, Murder by Numbers. We're going to have to do a top they, 10 Picross games on Switch one of these days. You remember when they caught <laughs> the Zodiac Killer by solving all those Sudoku puzzles? Yeah, that was, that was, that was, that was <laughs> a pretty good trick. Who could forget yeah. that moment of, of American history? Uh, yeah. Son of Sam was actually uh, Magic Eye. <laughs> <laughs> no. What? No. What do you no. want from us? <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, the final bit of news, which segues into our main topic, uh, PS4 crossplay left beta this week, which means that now more games will be able to do crossplay, which means we might start seeing more games like potentially Wargroove get crossplay with Switch uh, to PlayStation 4, which it already has with Xbox and PC, but now it might get that. Uh, that's just really cool to see. Uh, and it segues into our next topic and our big topic for the show today. What does the term next gen actually mean for Nintendo in 2020 and going forward? This is spurred, of course, by the news this week that the PlayStation 5 is actually called the PlayStation 5 and that it's going to be launching in holiday 2020, which is the same release window that we got for Xbox Project Scarlet, Scarlet. whatever that's going to be called, their next gen thing. Uh, so as we start looking towards the next gen of consoles... What is what is Nintendo's like? How does Nintendo factor into that? Because, and and first off, I want to kick this off with what generation is the Switch actually part of? Oh, that's you, a we oh can't that, no, we well, can't do that. We, we don't want. I don't want to like unpack it all together. Is but, Metroid Prime a first one. person shooter? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. My like, buckle up, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so so the 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 reason I bring this up, and we don't have to dig into the whole thing, but the technically. If you're going by traditional generations, mm -hmm. the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One are the same generation as the Wii U. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. The Wii U did so poorly. And that's generation eight, I believe. Yes. I don't Why I think not? it's no. I think it's generation eight. I yeah. don't think they should be numbered. That's too intimidating yeah. for me. But uh it came out, uh I, I checked all the years. The PlayStation 4 and the Xbox 360 came out in 2013. The Wii U came out in 2012, so it was a year before, mm -hmm. and then all of the Wii U didn't do well, and the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One were doing so well that their generations lasted, at, by the end of 2020, seven years, and the Wii U only lasted five. Yeah. And so the well, Switch what a five came out. It was. <laughs> so the Switch came out in 2017, so technically it's a generation ahead. Mm -hmm. It's going to be with whatever the PS5 is. Yeah. But by the time the PS5 comes out, it'll almost be a four year old system at that point. I, I've always kind of lumped systems together in the. Like in the way that you're playing them, right? Like, I, mm -hmm. I was playing the Dreamcast at the same time that I was playing the Nintendo 64 right. and the PlayStation. Yeah. So to me, the Dreamcast is the end of that generation, despite the fact that it was a 128-bit system like the PlayStation 2 and yeah. the Xbox, right? Um, if you were to walk into a video game store, like, the way the consoles and their libraries are sort of aggregated prominently, I think is a good way to sort of say, this is a generation right now. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but that's where it gets tricky, because the, I, I think that Nintendo doesn't, N Nintendo essentially started a new generation by screwing up. Yes. <laughs> like, and I mean that in a good way. The I love, way I love the Wii U. Generation. Yeah, exactly. But if like the Wii U had been a little bit more successful, this wouldn't be a conversation right now. Yeah. But the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox One 2 are going to be fighting <laughs> against the Nintendo Switch for the foreseeable future uh, until they launch whatever the next thing is, which will then begin the next generation. Yeah. Unless right. they wait. So, right. so the question I have, I guess, in this whole confusing mess of, of words and labels is, like, does this term, does the generation term even matter? Like, does the, term, it does. the term doesn't, the technical power of these systems do. Because right mm -hmm. now, the parity is just there in a possible way that we can get studios like Bethesda to bring stuff like Doom Eternal day and date hypothetically, mm -hmm. across all three of these systems. When that leap gets too far and that gap gets too wide, we will see less and less sort of comparable ports from PlayStation 5 games. I mean, the idea of like porting a PlayStation 5 game to the Nintendo Switch Lite is kind of crazy right now. Are there ways to get around it? Sure. But I think we'll see less and less of those. Yeah, the idea I, of like Assassin's Creed Black Flag being a late generation PlayStation 3 mm -hmm. game yep. and also a Wii U game and also an early generation PlayStation 4 game, but then something later like Assassin's Creed Odyssey mm -hmm. or Origins wouldn't they wouldn't make that backwards compatible to the PS3 in the same way that they yeah. would the previous game, right? That's like, a good way of putting it. It's technically the same generation, but you're talking mm -hmm. about like technological advancements yep. year over year that just can't keep up. Because that's like so, that's so that's so weird, like somewhere it's so deep into the console generation that like developers have figured out how to really get the most. Right. right. I mean, I think the fact that Nintendo is kind of left out of these conversations we're having regarding next gen is really telling in, in technically a negative way for a couple of reasons. One. 
like Brian said, the reason that they're even like in this pseudo gen is because the Wii U didn't do well. If it did, mm -hmm. it would have just been regular. And then the Switch maybe would have came out, right. you know, 2020 with everything else. Um, but not just that power wise, we don't really, at least I definitely don't think of like, what does next gen Nintendo look like in terms of power? I think yeah. of it in terms of ideas, which is cool in its own right. And Nintendo is definitely like my favorite of the three because it's so different. A lot of my favorite games are Nintendo games. But the fact that like next gen doesn't really mean a lot for Nintendo's power mm -hmm. is going to become more and more problematic as the other ones get better and better. Yeah. And that yeah. gap, like you said, and is going to get bigger. And it's like, we, you know, we always talk about like as Nintendo fans, oh, we want like more third party games. We want this or it'd be cool if we could do this or I wish this looked nicer. But that gap doesn't seem to be closing anytime soon. And with things getting progressively more and more technologically advanced, I'm somewhat concerned of like, how does that future look? You know, is it going to be totally in isolation from everything? But I think, sure. I think that Nintendo, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, I think that Nintendo has made that part of their ethos since the Wii era, right? Yeah. Like they are so less concerned with having the shiniest and brightest graphics. Like they, they carve their own path by creating experiences and innovation in terms of like, you can take the controllers off of this and now it's a different system or you can take it anywhere you want to go or you waggle a controller at it or you have a touchpad, you know, like in the right. controller. Right, but yeah. in that innovation is isolation. And right. to that yeah. point, I think you're you're totally right that the Nintendo for the last, what, three generations have always had the underpowered system compared mm -hmm. to their competitors, but it very rarely has the Switch felt like, oh, I this is too weak, right? Uh, for right. me, I'll in put, the games I'm Mario playing. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe against... Any PlayStation Five or any PlayStation Four game, right? You can totally notice it in ports, right? Yeah. When we look at The Witcher Three, when we look at the Wolfenstein ports, you can definitely notice that. But even upcoming games, like what did we say about when we were talking about Doom? We're not gonna, we wouldn't want to sure. play that on Switch, right. and that's a yes. game that I mean, it's now not gonna have a simultaneous release. But right. like, I think it's not just in. I think the issue goes deeper than ports. Well, I yeah. think, and there I th are games that I will not play on my Switch because they will not run well. Versus like PS4 versus Xbox, if I have both. It's more of like, oh, but that's, I like that's the, a caveat right the, there. Like, you have you have both, right? If I have and both. so that's the I thing. Like, if if you both. have, yeah, exactly. Well, you at least have you have Ac access. Yeah. you have access to the options. Um, I think for the average person who only owns a Switch mm -hmm. right now, having the option is pretty cool. Like, we may scoff at like playing a blurrier version of Doom, um, which I wasn't. I haven't been too crazy about the ports that, right. that Bethesda's done, but I'm I'm happy that they exist because they they exist as an option. What we're saying here is that there's a chance they go away. Yeah, um, and that's what scares me. Like, this is this is the thing is. At least to me, in terms of Nintendo games, games that aren't just ports, uh, I, I, I'm not really ups unhappy with the power level of the Switch, but that's a question of, you know, we're still a year away from yep. these next-gen mm -hmm. systems, and in two years, if we're still using the Switch, because it's a great, amazing selling system, and it's not going to just go away in five like the Wii U did, mm -hmm. at that point, what does this look like? Well, l like, let's consider the generation over generation improvements made starting with the 2DS line or the Game Boy line even, right? Like the Nintendo is not a company that is afraid to iterate on a concept that already exists, especially right. like a known quantity. So like they've, they've already released a Switch Lite, which is reversion 1.0, right? Um, I can't imagine that that they will always put out the Nintendo Switch in some capacity, but I can guarantee that for the next five-ish years through the next generation, the Switch will be the console that they are constantly iterating on and maybe putting in a more powerful chipset or, you know, looking for that sort of competitive edge. But again, like, their games are specifically engineered for innovation and they're looking to that first. Yep. And they're less concerned about competing with Sony and Microsoft because they're, they're more interested in creating individual experiences yeah. that are tailored to like their vision. There's also like, what were we going to say? Well, so that, I, well, that was going to lead me to my next question, mm -hmm. but if you want to get one. No, more I ahead. wanted to say real quick, uh, much of this is irrelevant because next November on Black Friday, the Nintendo Switch could hypothetically drop to 199 <laughs> with a bundled in game. What a world. It's already and, 199. Yeah, exactly. The Switch Lite already is, right? <laughs> exactly. You just don't get Joy-Con. But I mean, the base Switch with the, you know, 10 hour battery life that they've just sort of like quietly did a, done a soft refresh on. Mm -hmm. Right. You can bundle that with Breath of the Wild or Mario Kart for two hundred dollars and go head to head on Black Friday with next gen consoles. It'll probably be five hundred or six hundred dollars, like yeah. honestly. And then that that just inhales a bunch of of, of wallets and mind share and everything. You know, it's just it gets you out of that conversation and you can dodge a bullet for a little while. You yeah. Know? So that, I mean, that that brings me into this this next part of this, which is going into holiday twenty twenty when you, you know you've already brought up this bundle option, but there will be these crazy big 
insane SSD driven ray tracing systems out there that are grabbing people's attention. So do you think like what do you think the the Nintendo strategy should be going into that sort of world? Is Breath it- of the Wild too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean they have Animal Crossing yeah. in spring and they'll probably have another Pokemon game. What a brilliant like, answer. Never mind. You, I'll shut up. We're games on. games yeah. sell game systems and yeah. you need to have a giant flagship title. And we had a bunch of great ones this year and there was a bunch of third party stuff and we have mm-hmm. Animal Crossing and Pokemon next year, but you need Breath of the Wild too. That's yeah. that's your big goal. As much as I would love for a Switch Pro to exist, um, even if PS5 never came, I just want a better Switch because I love my Switch. So why wouldn't I want one that is stronger and, and more powerful and has better battery, et cetera? Right. Um, but yeah, I would, I'd agree with Brian. I think what makes the most sense for them as a company would just be to like have a great bundle or a great release because even though like next, next gen, if we want to call it that PS5, Xbox zero, um, or whatever they're going to name it is coming out. Like they just had the switch light and I don't think they really want to like start truncating that so soon. Like mm-hmm. I think it would make more sense to see a switch pro if that ever exists in 2021, 22, rather than like right now, just to try to like keep up with everyone. Cause they're not going to anywhere. They're kind of doing something yeah. else. So other yeah. option is Mario Kart nine. That's your, that's your, you know, Mario sell. Kart ultimate, all of the tracks that have ever existed. And I love that. You know, yeah. what's funny is I like Mario Kart eight deluxe so much that I had not even thought of the idea of them making another Mario Kart. Yeah. I was just mm-hmm. like, this game's and like, you're, you're, playing, you're, another. you're playing a Wii U leftover too. That's like last gen. <laughs> so right? great. Yeah, but you don't even think about it like that. Yeah. No, it's definitely true. So, so is that, I mean, Zach, you already kind of brought that up, but is that similar to how you feel like it's more of a focus on software than hardware? That's been Nintendo's focus since the Nintendo 64. Right. Like, you know, like they, we actually catch a lot of heat for this because like, or Nintendo does, I guess, uh, by proxy, but a lot of Nintendo detractors, their thing is like, they just keep remaking the same games. It's just a new version of Mario, a new version of Zelda, a new version of XYZ, right? Um, However, like, yeah. One of the best continue If they continue to deliver on those games and iterate in a way that is innovative, like, like nobody would have ever guessed that Breath of the Wild would be the game that it was. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, they could have done a game that was more similar in style and mechanics to Twilight Princess or Skyward Sword. But the fact that they're willing to call something Zelda, but completely re innovate and reimagine what that franchise is, is like, okay, great. Like you can slap a name on like a new subtitle to the next Mario game, but it could be a completely different kind of game. You never they know also, where it's going to go. Yeah, Nobody they, thought Mario would become a giant slab of meat falling into a puddle. Exactly. Of and, and to piggyback off what you're saying, they, they also don't annualize these these things. So mm-hmm. they don't uh, actually sort of water them down until mm-hmm. you're annoyed by them like yeah. a lot of other, you know, sort of AAA third-party devs do with, with, with their franchises. Yeah. And it shows also, this is a tangent, but it, that, that resistance to annualization is like it bears fruit everywhere it's used like mm-hmm. when Assassin's Creed broke off of the annualized schedule and took a break and came back with Assassin's Creed Origins like I think there you you'd be hard pressed to find a person who wouldn't say that that was a good idea yeah. right and didn't revitalize it in some way um okay so then if if the focus at least for their next gen is mostly software based mostly this idea of m- take what the the already great thing that they have and just make it more appealing more more cost effective Huge game coming out, which man, if Breath of the Wild two came out holiday twenty twenty alongside these next gen things, I mean, I, Is that I would what you be think? willing to put money on it. Really, how much money? I it's tens of dollars. I'd actually be well, willing to bet that it's it's the following spring that it's it's similar to the Breath of the Wild. I, I think release. I think Brian's absolutely right. Like I think that they need Breath of the Wild two to compete with these next generation consoles. Mm. Like I think that as a known quantity, it needs to be there to deliver. Like here is the sequel to one of mm. the greatest games of all time. And you're looking at a situation like Majora's Mask where, like, the assets in the engine already exist and are yeah. proven, right? Like, all they need to do is build the new stuff on top of that. I don't think they'll and reinvent the wheel with this. I game. don't think so either. I Nor think do they I need think we're to. Looking at, like, I think we're looking at Mario Galaxy 1 and 2, yeah. but make it Zelda. What were the gaps like, between those releases? Do you guys know offhand? Otherwise? Between I, what? Uh, Galaxy 1 even and Galaxy two? 1 and 2 or... I'm not sure. Uh, Galaxy Majora's 1 and Mask. 2, I believe, was 2007 and 2009. Yeah, I want to say it was two or three years. And mm. uh, Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time was 1998 and 2001. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the Breath of the Wild is, what, two, three years old now? It, it will be three years. It'll be three in, years in March. Yeah, in yeah. So, March. Yeah, yeah, so we're getting there. Um, yeah, it's actually a good point. Yeah, I, I think just th- like throwing, in, <laughs> throwing in dungeons, throwing in some new powers and stuff like that... Um, whatever they call those things where you could levitate magnets and such. 
Stasis? What are they called? Isis. Stasis Isis. is Isis. one of them. Magnesis. Yeah. yeah. Are they just called Isis? I think they're just called powers. Just powers? Okay. I don't remember. I There's a name and people are screaming at me right now, yeah. so we'll figure <laughs> it out. It Bom- um, bombistis. But yeah, I, I, I don't think they need to, like, I don't think they need to reinvent the wheel on this one. I think they yeah. can add a few cool new things and get it out there and it'll sell really well. So we've been talking about... Uh, this idea then of a Switch Pro as kind of almost an inevitability. I mean, probably it's just going to be called the new Switch or yeah. whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, because the they, new Nintendo Switch. Yeah, yeah they already absolutely makes sense. They deluxe. already brought back the light from DS Lite, right. and they they like reusing that sort of terminology a little bit. As long as they don't go the Switch U, I think we're good mm. in that regard. But uh, if the focus for holiday 2020, if we think the focus for holiday 2020 is not going to be on new hardware, like. When do you think the right time for that is? Do you think that's a 2021 thing? Do you think it's even farther off? Well, let's take a look. This at, is pure speculation, of course. That. Let's take a look yeah. at PlayStation yeah. 4 versus PlayStation 4 Pro, Xbox versus Xbox One X, right? Mm. Um, I don't necessarily, especially with the in the case of Xbox One X, I don't think that um, Microsoft and Sony were particularly quick to rush out an iterative version of those consoles, right? When so did those come out? PlayStation like four or Play- five years into three. their lives? So PlayStation 4 launched in 2013, and PlayStation 4 Pro was, I believe, 2016. Is that right? Uh, I'm not sure about Pro, actually. I don't think it was no, 2017. No, I think it, it might have been 2017, actually. But it was like three or it's four like years. It's like three or four yeah. years, right? Yeah, it's around so, there. I mean... Now that I've now that I've said it out loud, I realize that like that would put that right on track through a launch in a holiday window. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah I mean, Switch Lite like, kind of throws a wrench in that a little. Well, bit. if yeah. that's the case, like let's consider twenty sixteen like, for PS4 Pro. Uh, Breath of the really Wild two launches alongside Nintendo Switch Pro. Right, but the hardcore that's also, like, gaming. That's also like a pretty a pretty <laughs> small gap between the Pro and the Nintendo Switch Lite. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Though I feel like a lot of these like I. I and obviously we should look to history <laughs> to indicate what comes next. But like, I feel like a lot of these are based on this idea of what traditionally has happened. And the Switch Lite feels like a deviation from that already because yeah. it's technically a weaker version because it can do less. It's, like, the, it's, it's not the like a Xbox worse version. It's the One S of the Switch, right? It's well, uh, I would say the One S is better than the baseline Xbox. Yeah, but there's like no, well, I guess there is a disc drive. No, you're thinking of the, like disc the disc list. Yeah. yeah. Be careful when you say uh, that. Xbox, yeah. one. X- X- Xbox one. one Sad Edition. Yes. Yeah. Um, it is. So it's normally, Xbox One S all digital. I know that it is. And I even when you think of like that that the 3DS family <laughs> and the 2DS coming out, like that was towards the end of like that 3DS family cycle. So yeah. it's already kind of odd for Nintendo to say, here's the Nintendo Switch, and then here is a weaker slash more affordable model before doing a more powerful one, which does make me wonder, maybe they won't ever do a more powerful one because it just seems weird to really- I honestly don't think they will do a more powerful one yeah. ever. I think they'll relaunch that brand- with How like, dare you? The brand new I think thing. there's, if I had to bet, I would say they're not going to make something more powerful. How dare you as well? Um, I dare. Why? Two dares. Well, the, it's the interesting thing they was they've talking- They've never done that ever. <laughs> That's not true. They did it with the Nintendo 3DS. The yeah, they 3DS. did. That's that true. was like a half step. They oh, put it's, a no, it's so good. Excuse me. What? Versus the, base one, versus the base one. Like, I think you're thinking of it too incrementally. Like, the 3DS XL, like the new 3DS XL is the, much better than the base one. No, but in DS. terms of incremental power that mm-hmm. uh, uh, was basically justifiable oh, yeah. for like four games total. Yeah, like but you know what? Step. Didn't they, they sell the expansion pack as part of Donkey Kong Country 64 and they like used and, it for t- uh, two times? Dark, I think yeah. um, they put a whole another nub on that system. That nub is That's great. That's true. Yeah, for the people that didn't have the boat. <laughs> That's right. Remember the boat? Worth yeah, worth the know. price of admission alone. The, yeah, it was like this was big like, dock thing like, that worked for like Metal Gear Solid yeah, like, I don't, Three I don't and think Resident Evil Revelations. The, it, the Switch it required Pro. its own batteries. The Switch Pro, if it does exist, I feel like it would have that same benefit of the new 3DS XL, where it's like. It's not groundbreaking, and if you don't have it, you don't really need it. But if you haven't gotten it yet, it is the best version of that family. So mm-hmm. I could still see, like, I don't think the Switch Pro is going to be have the power power of the PS5 or the PS4. Like, I don't think that. I think it'll just be a little bit better. But that's what I would want. Mm-hmm. That's what and, uh, 1080p screen would be nice. Dan Stapleton actually, uh, Dan <laughs> Dan has been on a, like a pedantic rant on Twitter lately, where no. he's like picking apart. I know, right? Where he's like picking apart the way that we talk about games, and I think it's really interesting. It kind of started with this discussion about Death Stranding going gold and what does that mean in mm-hmm. an era when day one patches exist. Um, but today he was talking about the idea that like the next generation of Apple uh, iPhones uh, yeah, and mobile- Android phones will be as powerful, if not more powerful, than the Nintendo Switch. And you can hook up controllers to them. So, like, where is the argument that the Switch won't have to beef up to compete with what is essentially, like, mobile competitors, right? And I guess that... Doesn't... Those things don't have Zelda. Yeah, that's the argument, right? And And they have a worse Mario Kart, and it's also, like, it's cumbersome to take out your iPhone and, like, put it... They have tried for a decade now to make, like 
grips and attachments yeah. to your phone to turn that in. It's just ultimately that's not what that is. This the switch for all of its like all the negativity we gave it at launch for being so feature incomplete and stuff like that is a system that is dedicated yeah, for gaming. You don't get you don't get emails on it, you don't get texts. I want you Netflix. Just, you what? Still can't I want watch Netflix. Netflix, Netflix yeah. is a different so yeah. I, I mean Netflix. it totally needs Netflix. <laughs> I on but, Netflix. But to your on point, everything. the Switch does not need Twitter or Facebook. No. Right? I'm so glad it Switch doesn't have has Twitter. Though, um, well, no, the Switch lets you post to yes. Twitter yeah. or Facebook, but it doesn't. That's Which is surprising. You can watch that. YouTube videos of Twitter on the YouTube app. That is one of the funniest things in the world to me <laughs> is when the Switch, when you tweet from the Switch and then it goes, go to a browser on a desktop PC in yeah. order to yeah. see yeah. this. Phone. And yeah. you're like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of like now just getting on a total tangent from Nintendo, but I felt like Dan's tweet was more talking about like, why do we even have a distinction of mobile games when so many mobile games are on consoles? That's kind of more how I read that one. So, yeah. And I feel like yeah. that's kind of a separate discussion. Well, it's also the, the conversation is like, power. We, we call a Switch a handheld or a console, but we don't talk about it as like a mobile gaming platform, despite the fact that a significant percentage of the Switch library is mobile ports, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Anyway, let's welcome Dan Stapleton right now to comment on this. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, it, we would it's... never invite him on this show. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> I would. I'm gonna. Next week. He's oh. on. No. Um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's a really interesting discussion, and I just think it's going to be really interesting. I think your guys' call out of leaning into the software that defines the system as we go towards a PS5 and an Xbox One, Two, as you called it, Brian, which I hope to God they actually call it. It's that. in line with the utterly bafflingly confusing iteration names that they've had. I hope they go 720. I hope they just Xbox. Oh, I yeah, love yeah, that. yeah. And That's then next they'll do the Xbox okay. Two. Yeah, yeah I mean, in Nintendo's knows? next. A hardware move will be dictated by the market. Right. Like when they see a massive uh, sort of like pause or decline in sales for their their current lineup, then they'll start hustling yeah. and they'll you know I revolutionize. I think that's a great way, way to summarize that. Yeah. yeah. I hope they start putting out playing cards again. To be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Just go well, back you can get playing physical. cards. I'll bring back with that AR functionality. Um, yeah. 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 I want to I want to point out, and I, I hope that I'm not being too reductive here. Like this has been a really interesting conversation about the next generation of Nintendo hardware. But I think the idea, like the TLDR of this conversation, is that Nintendo is going to rely on software and the proper the intellectual properties that it already owns, right, and has maintained. Again. That has been Nintendo's game plan for the better part of two decades. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't think we're saying anything particularly groundbreaking. No, no I mean, even but it's a that. different conversation when this is the first time in yeah, they're essentially 20-some years yeah. where they're the hard. gap between a Nintendo system and the new PlayStation and Xbox, or not Xbox, but the gap between the t Nintendo system and PlayStation has been more than three yeah, years. Like, what if I told you Nintendo yeah. that's already the, led us into the next gen? That's the biggest that console powerful. gap we've had between a, a Sony system and Nintendo system Ever, Honestly, which is a big deal. And I can say this as somebody that's also on our PlayStation show, but I'm more concerned at how Xbox and PlayStation are going to convince their audiences that they need to go spend 600 bucks. Mm -hmm. It's true. Like, I mean, that's, but that's, that's a whole other topic. Yeah, totally. For a whole I mean, so that's show. why I think Nintendo, Nintendo's good. I think they're good for a uh, while. Yeah. I've been saying it for the better part of five years, but like what I want from any console manufacturer is Nintendo PlayStation or otherwise is to release a console called the PlayStation or the Nintendo. And it's an iterative console and you just upgrade. They, you know, like every Honestly, few years they send out like, Hey, this is the new CPU. This well, now is we the have new a PC, graphics card, but so. that's, that's a PC, right? But like if it's plug and play, like you buy one base unit and then every few years you spend $200 to update the graphics card. Or there's something. a, we like, might mobile, be getting close to that, to be honest. There's, yeah. a, there's a mobile, com I don't uh, touch a mobile phone <laughs> company that attempted that recently that had this like, I Modular, yeah, yeah. modular, phone, yeah, and you yeah. could like t take the camera out and put next year's camera in and yeah. stuff like that. But it's also like if you look at the like if you look at iPhones and stuff, they are trying that thing where they're like people will buy the new one every single year. How and yeah. depending on how well those numbers do, we might get several PlayStations, we might get several Nintendo Switches. So yeah. who knows? We'll, we'll see. What a time to be alive! Yeah, we'll have to see. Uh, I, I'm not worried for Nintendo. That's definitely the moral of this story. But uh, I'm I'm excited <laughs> to see kind of story. how mm -hmm. it goes uh, how it goes forward in the next mm -hmm. year. Thank you guys for chatting with me about that. Let's move on to uh, the games that came out this week because there are there are a fair amount this week. Next hey. week is even like more stacked. You start getting things like The Witcher next week and yeah. Overwatch can I, next can week. Can I take a quick but, poll? Do you guys plan on playing The Witcher on Switch? Yeah. No. You are? Probably, yeah. Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. It's not going to look as good. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm probably not just because that's a big old game. <laughs> I, I think that I'll probably 
buy it and have it there just to pick up and play in the same way that I have Skyrim on my Switch. Yeah, that's like, that's my logic. Yeah, but like I'm already you know 20 hours deep into a big RPG, and I just don't know that I have the time to like sit and spend a lot of time. With that's it. a yeah. Zach, That's a cool one to have just to sort of be like I'm, I'm interested to see how that game scales as like a portable game to mm -hmm. like hop in and do one side quest. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've always approached that game with this sort of like okay, dim the lights. Sit down in front of the TV. Take like, your shirt off. Take my shirt <laughs> off. Um, just a stick of Please butter stop. on each shoulder. And I think they're frowning. <laughs> when both sticks of butter have melted, my game time yeah. is done and I'm fully cooked. I open the windows so a menagerie of birds can come in and put my coat on. Well, I have as, a routine, obviously. As, as much as I know you guys want to talk about The Witcher, that's a game that comes out next week. Let's talk about Apologies. this week. Uh, the first game I wanted to give a shout out to was Eternal. My birds. <laughs> Surprising no one, this is actually a card game. It's a free-to-play card game called Eternal uh, that is made by Direwolf Digital. And uh, it's just, a, it's a pretty dang good card game. It's a it's a really good middle ground between something like Hearthstone and Magic. So if you're into card games, check that one out. That came out on the 8th and is free. Uh, although, you know, it's got the normal microtransaction card gamey stuff in it. Uh, Trine 4 came, came out on October 8th, also $30. Uh, we gave it an 8.5. Mr. Mitchell Seltzman gave that an 8.5 in his review. Um, Great. So, uh, Trine 4 is awesome. Yeah, I've been playing it too. Yeah, Trine 4 is such a cool return to... F I, I hate I hate return to, say form. return to form. Fans God. of the genre will enjoy. Jesus. Uh, no, it's I, hard to believe it's been 10 years I, since I the last... I really, year. really like Trine 4. I didn't hate Trine 3, like the way that people dislike Trine 3, but mm -hmm. Trine 4 is such a cool action puzzle game. Yep. And are you are you playing it with anybody, or are you just doing solo? No, I'm Dude, all you should play it. you should play it with your wife, uh, because that game... Solving the puzzles together with somebody in tandem is brilliant. Like yeah. it's so fun and it works so well. And it's like just kind of got this charming, funny little art style. And like um, I I'm really enjoying Trine Four a lot. I think it's it's really good. And Mitchell's review is like right on the money. Yep. I think. Yeah. No, I played it a bunch on my flights from uh, to and from New York Comic Con. So I didn't have any friends, but it's it's a really good. You time. didn't just pass the controller off to somebody like hey, a stranger. Up. Well, yeah. You're not gonna make <laughs> friends. <laughs> not sure, so. Well, it's good to hear that it is it's a, great. Is yeah. a return to the shape at once was is that better no mm -hmm. okay. i cool. feel bad uh another game that came out on october 8th this was a busy tuesday this week uh was call of cthulhu a cthulhu based adventure -y game uh third person i believe we gave this game an 8.6 when we reviewed it originally i believe on pc back when it came out objectively better than trying for by 0.1 oh yeah this is going up we got one more yeah. after this too that's 8.7 uh this game is 40 dollars uh if you're a cthulhu creepy existential horror sort of person, adventure game person, uh, one to check out as well. Uh, if you like the opposite of that and like happy things that make you smile and are very bubbly, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair also came out on October 8th for $30, and we gave that one an 8.7. Is anybody else playing the game? I just started it okay. earlier today. I'm like, yeah. I did like one level. I said this on Beyond, but I think it's really interesting that they're essentially going back to the roots of like Donkey Kong Country yeah. right. after making a game that was basically a Banjo Kazooie. Yeah, so this, which, for, like, for people who aren't familiar, uh, this is X Rare Devs. It's a developer called Platonic, who are X Rare Devs, who made Ukulele, which was essentially, as you said, a 3D platformer in the vein of Banjo Kazooie. Mm -hmm. um, and they also are the people who made Donkey Kong Country, and now they're just doing a Donkey Kong Country game pretty yeah. much. Not, which is pretty that's, awesome. that's reductive, I, but you know. It's got a very sort of similar kind of like locomotion to Donkey mm. Kong Country, like the rolling and jumping mechanics, which makes it feel different than something like Sonic or Mario, obviously. Yeah, it doesn't, I, I'm really, really early in but i wasn't in love with like the feel of how the character moved yep mm. um so um, we'll see maybe it all you know i'm in early level so really what makes these games or breaks these games is the level design so mm -hmm. it'll depend on how it advances uh, i'm also not a fan of like it has like that overworld map where you can kind of walk around Don the last like Hong Kong I played was Country Returns on the 3DS. Mm. Um, and it's just, I feel like I would have just, uh, oh yeah, Tropical Freeze, actually, I played that too. Um, it would just be better if it was just going from level to level. So, and the load times were really long. I noticed I that on too. PS4, I don't know how it is on Switch. No, they're, they're pretty rough on Switch, actually. Yeah, it, was, it took me 12 Mississippis for a load screen. I counted just wow. to give people... On the IGN scale? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, on that, it's um, a new scale that we can Yeah, I noticed I, the same thing. I know Jonathan is playing this as well, Jonathan Dornbush, the host of Beyond, who, uh, and I think he was really enjoying it as well. Uh, I'm excited to jump into it because it's totally my speed of game. Yep. Yeah. And I enjoyed Ukulele, but was a little disappointed by it. So, so. I, like... Ukulele was a weird game because when it was announced, people in the office are losing their minds because you have like a lot of Banjo Kazooie fans. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of came out to sort of mediocre reviews and then quickly disappeared. So I'm really glad that Platonic had a, an opportunity to 
get a win in as well yeah. mm-hmm. because like people seem to love this game. Yeah, I haven't heard like, anything bad about yeah, it. Yeah, it's like a, kind of a reimagination for the series, and I think those characters are really cute and funny, and so it's nice that they they didn't pivot and take some time off and come out with something completely different. Like they yeah. kind of reimagine what that series yeah. was, and I especially because it works a little better. Kickstarter funded spiritual successors made by their own developers do not have the best track record in mm-hmm. the world, and a lot of the times those games come out and the, the developer kind of falls into obscurity and can't really do anything else. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. very new glad to see... Club. Whoa, wait, no. I just wish that they would make a new game. <laughs> they're just they're only making Shovel Knight. Well, they're they doing they great made a bunch of Shovel promises Knight, in 1806. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they I'm glad to see that didn't happen to them. I'm glad, like you said, I'm glad that Platonic kind of got another shot at something yeah, that I, people are enjoying more. I will mm-hmm. say that once you actually get in and start playing this game and get past the load times, and the, I'm, I'm, I'm with you in this sort of cumbersome overworld, um, it's super fun. And it's like, it's yeah. challenging and the boss fights are good and everything like that. So Clarification, I wasn't saying that Yacht Club has faded into obscurity. I was just saying that they've spent the majority of their time developing on one. Yeah, I mean, clearly they're still on your mind. We they're get it. Something right. You don't like Shovel Knight. We oh! know Anyway. Lift up my shirt. I got a Shovel Knight tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> you want to stop taking their shirts off. On yeah, we've got to stop okay. hypothetically happening on this show. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, if you haven't listened to the podcast, you, you got to watch brother? the video. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them. Uh, a couple other things. There's a bundle called the Old School RPG Bundle I wanted to give a shout out to. This comes out on October 10th for $30. It's got Knights of Pen and Paper, Knights of Pen and Paper 2, and Chroma Squad, uh, which are three games I would all heartily recommend. Uh, Chroma Squad, I've talked about before, is kind of like a uh, 2D top down pixelated XCOM, but you're all Power Rangers and you're actually shooting a Power Ranger TV show what? rather than like fight. It's really cool. Dude, that sounds awesome. Yeah, and Knights of Pen and Paper is this series that does like it's a tabletop RPG sort of spin. It used to be a mobile game. It's it's very very cute. Uh, so if you've got a bunch of money to blow and you want three very good pixelated games. The old school RPG bundle. So a good one. This cool. is interesting because these are sort of recently released Nintendo Switch indie games, right? That are kind of being yeah. They're they're none of them are new games. Yeah, but they're all games that only re- relatively recently came to Switch. And they're like thematically similar. They're in, thematically in some loose way and graphically similar. Yeah. But I looked it up. I don't know what the connection is. Honestly, Knights of Pen and Paper and Chroma Squad are different developers, different publishers. I'm not. Totally yeah, sure I, what I the find that is. to be like a really interesting strategy. Is indie devs who launched a game on Switch and probably got deep Decent sales, like joining forces and bundling up their software to make some compelling new package. Like yeah, that's, who's, who's publishing this bundle? Uh, I'm I'm not me? sure actually. Yeah, it's Brian Altano. <laughs> Altano publishing. That's a huge conflict of interest. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Game um, of the year though. Moving on, there's a couple other ones I wanted to call out. Uh, October 10th, Eliza is coming out for $15. This is a visual novel made by Zachtronics. Zachtronics uh-huh. is if you guys remember me ever yelling about a game called. Uh, Opus Magnum. Opus Magnum, I think, is one of the best puzzle games ever made flat out, and I, I mean that genuinely. Zachtronics also does Infinifactory. They did Space Chem was one of their breakout games. They've made a ton of really amazing puzzle games, and for their latest one, they made a, a visual novel, mm. and I've heard very good things about it. It's cool. just kind of a, a left turn for them, but it's coming out on Switch on the 10th, so that's very cool. Uh, a couple others. The Bradwell Conspiracy comes out on 1010 on October 10th uh, for $20. This is a first-person puzzly adventure game, kind of in the vein of Portal, narrative-driven, uh, weird puzzly mechanics, a little bit of humor, but also a very dark situation. I played and beat this. It's only about three hours long. Uh, I played and beat this in this weekend. It's really fun. It's really good if you like that type of game. It's a little rough around the edges. Like, it feels a little... Um, I don't know what the word is. It, it it feels a little lower budget, even though that's like a mean thing to say, mm-hmm. I guess. It just feels a little bit like... Uh, In look or performance? A little of both. It's a little buggy. It's got a, a little bit of hitches here and there. Some of the puzzles you're like, oh, this is a little unintuitive. Like maybe it just needed a little bit more testing. But the actual game is just very, very fun and the... VO in it is phenomenal. I mentioned this nice. game on on Beyond as well. Uh, the main person who talks to you the entire time is a character named Amber. She's like one of some of the best vo- game voice acting I've I've heard in a long time. And then the other main voice, who's your AI guide in your glasses, is actually voiced by the guy who did Bayek in Assassin's Creed oh. Origins. So it, it's really really top notch vocal work in this game, and that actually made me l- enjoy an otherwise bumpy experience a lot more than I would have. And I yeah, I'd, I'd recommend it. Um, maybe not like as explodey as you've heard me recommend some other indie games on this on this show, but it's it's a cool one for sure. Uh, two more on the eleventh for fifty dollars. Doraemon story story of seasons is coming out in the West. Yeah. This is a Doraemon themed or licensed story of seasons game, which is basically Harvest Moon. 
Yeah, yeah, Harvest Moon. Yeah, I was gonna say Story of Seasons is basically Harvest Moon, and Doraemon is basically Japanese Mickey Mouse. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that's a lot. Yeah, except that he's like a robot otter cat, or something he's like, like a that. weird, yeah, amalgam of things. But like in in Japan, he is as ubiquitous as Mickey Mouse is yeah. here in the states, and he is as recognizable to like Japanese children as Mickey is. He I'm, can't go anywhere. That's right. I'm not sure how uh, I'm not sure how loved awful. this game is or anything. But if you are a Story of Seasons fan or a Doraemon weirdly a Doraemon fan yeah. in the states, yeah. 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 or just Curious. And finally, one I'm very <laughs> excited for finally has released yes. date on the 11th, $20, Killer, Killer Queen, Queen Black. Black. Killer Queen Black is uh, the console version or the, the home version of the Killer Queen arcade cabinet that they've now, which you could only normally play on an arcade cabinet, which costs like $20,000. You had to find one in somebody's, like a bar or something like that. I spent like a that. solid five months trying to convince people to get a Killer Queen arcade cabinet here. I we had, that. God, I want we had this like... Just sell some of the ones we have. There was a whiteboard <laughs> in our in our break room that had a bunch of arcade yeah. games listed once, and everybody was like, we want to, they were like, we're going to buy an arcade. Which one should we get? And everybody put their votes next to it, and then it, we just never got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was like, Star Wars Battle Pod, and it just never happened. I'm, I'm so curious to see how this translates relates to uh, the Switch. Yeah. It's like how this experience translates mm -hmm. to the Switch. Because Killer Queen is so unbelievably fun, but part of the fun in that is that you're playing, it's it's 4v4. No, it's 5v5 it's five five on five. You're right, mm -hmm. it's 10 players. But they're all right there, and you're yeah. all like, yeah. like essentially seeing your opponents and like the two screens mm -hmm. that are, you know, like all the actions happening across yep. the two screens. So I, I wonder how that experience translates. Because I could play Killer Queen Black online against 10 other people, but it's not nearly as interesting as it would be to play even 2v2 right here at this table and all be on our Switch. Yeah, I, I think you know? it definitely would lend itself to like a local experience just because so much of the fun is like, in jumping in and introducing other people to the game. We like, got to get some matches going on the... the Absolutely. Yeah. And it's super exciting. Yeah. Um, and it's really easy to like... I, I know a lot, of, not, a lot of people listening might not have played it because if you're not in a city that has arcades, you probably haven't played it. But it's really easy to pick up. There's different ways to win. We've talked about this game like a bunch on here somehow, even though it wasn't a Nintendo game before. I don't right. know why it came up, Is but... Is this like a surprise release? We didn't know this. No, thing, this right? has been in development yeah. for a very no, 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 long time. I knew that it was coming to the Switch. I yeah. feel like it was announced really early on. It was. I just mean this release date in the, particular, I feel like, kind of snuck up. The release date wasn't like announced too in advance. I think I found out about it maybe like a month ago. Yeah. Just from like a random PR email. But I really missed that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely an under the radar one that everyone should play because it's super fun. Yeah. yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing this as you well. Get little actually berries. You get to ride a little yeah. snail into a little <laughs> goalpost. Yeah. It's adorable and simple and very fun. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, I want to talk a little bit about what we've been playing this week. I think we touched on some of it. Like I was just going to bring up Bradwell, but does anybody have anything that stood out to them this week? Um, I will once again get on the soapbox and say play Dragon Quest XI as ah. Definitive Edition. I'm Like I said, I'm about 20 hours in. Man, that is a hell of a can game. I, can I ask a stupid question? Yes. I played about the first hour of that game mm -hmm. in 2D mm -hmm. and then went to a church and switched over to 3D mm -hmm. and it feels like the game restarted. So the 2D to 3D transition stuff is really weird. I actually haven't been popping in and out because mm -hmm. the one time that I wanted to do that, I was like, oh, maybe I'll just play the next couple hours in 2D. Um, it wanted me to go back to a certain point in the game. You have to I go think, to like a church. I think there are milestones in the game where it allows you to switch to 2D. Okay. But it doesn't telegraph those. I'm, I might be completely wrong, but when I when I was just like arbitrarily one night, was like, I'm going to play tonight in 2D. Right, right, right. But it prompted me. It was like, okay, you can choose to go back and play in 2D, but it will send you back to this point in the story, not just like on yeah. your map. And no, that's, that that's what happened to me. I, yeah. I guess I was led to believe it would be a little bit more seamless than that. So there are areas in the game, I don't know if, if I'd really consider this a spoiler, but there are areas in the game that it sends you into the past. And <laughs> it's really funny, because it's all like side quest stuff, but the the way that you go into the past, it sends you into the 2D oh, mode. Oh, that's cool. And so that's kind of cool. And so it's you a have way an to idea experience. Of... It's a way to experience that without necessarily like Got having it. to go back and playing the whole the, thing in over. the plot. Yeah. Cool. Mm. But man, the writing is super funny. The character design is amazing. It looks incredible on the Switch. It is like not groundbreaking in the the story that it's telling. It's like, oh, five plucky heroes set out to save the world. But like <laughs> I'm having such a good time with it, and it's the kind of game that, like, when I'm not playing it, like, I've been busy the last couple nights, and, like, last night I got home at, like, 
ten thirty and was like, oh, it's too late to play Dragon Quest. I gotta go to bed. Like you know, and, <laughs> like and I'm really, really enjoying it, and I'm afraid that it's gonna get overlooked on the Switch. Oh, you should have played it. And yeah. this one, this is one that we might be talking a little bit more about next week because we might have Mr. Seth Macy in the in the office to talk about it oh. and gush about it as well. Cool. cool. I will. Awesome. I will play more of it then. Um, I had a weird thing happen where I uh, started Dragon Quest Eleven. And then realized that the original, I just unplugged something, so that's probably not good. I realized that the, <laughs> the original Dragon Quest, Dragon Quest 1, came out on Switch at the same time. It's just called Dragon yeah, Quest. Yes, just called Dragon Quest 1. Super Mario Brothers 1. <laughs> Legend of Zelda 1. No, uh, launched at around the same time. And so I was like, I have fond memories of playing this game, I believe it was called Dragon Warrior, mm -hmm. and it came out in America. I got a free copy of it with Nintendo Power, which is like a lot of people's exposure to that game. It is not a great game, but it is a game I'm nostalgic for. Mm -hmm. And I've been on this weird kick where I kind of wanted to play sort of simple rudimentary RPGs again, just to sort of refresh myself about why I like that genre. Because I think that like RPGs were really iterative for a while and people loved them. And then they got very complicated and people loved them more. And I think that like people didn't want them to be simple anymore because there were like hundreds of them. But I never really had the opportunity to get burned out on them because I only played a few here and there. You're trying to burn yourself. Yeah, so I'm trying to burn myself. So I went back to like the roots of this game before I jump into 11, which I'm really excited to play more of, and um, found that there's like a lot of really interesting, charming stuff in this game. And it's a weird port because it's essentially the mobile port. And so you get pixel art, but you also get these dialogue boxes that look like something you'd find in like a you know Square Enix mobile yeah. game. Um, well, I mean which is what it is, yeah. Game, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I know the creator was kind of like pissed off that this is the version people can play on Switch, but for me, it was, you know, it was like five bucks. It's right there. Um, and I'm really digging it. It's just like walking around and grinding and fighting, fighting the earliest versions of those enemies. Right. I feel like seeing that and then jumping into 11 is going to make me have like a really big appreciation mm. for it. Mm. Yeah, I, I really love the enemy design in 11. Some of them are really funny and weird and like just the, the art style in of, its, of itself is like... Um, it's Akira Toriyama who does all the art yep. design for all of the Dragon Quest games and then also Dragon Ball Z, but it just, it's these funny, like, puffy 3D versions of, like, essentially Dragon Ball characters yep. and enemies, and, like, I love it, man. I think it's so funny, and I'm kicking myself for not really getting into the series prior because I've only played eight and that was only because it came with a demo of Final Fantasy XII. Yeah, like, I, that was I, the only reason that I got into it in the first place. I played a bunch of eight too, and I think I watched a friend of mine play a ton of the one right before that. What oh, seven, seven, <laughs> six. It's usually how it works. Yeah, um, but no, this is like this is going to be my first time, sort of in a very long time, reconnecting with this franchise, and I'm excited. Talk, talk about Ori real quick. Oh yeah, um, yeah I also I also started playing Ori, which is like you have no shortage of Metroidvania games on Switch, but this um, might. Be the best one. This might be the best one, honestly. So um, good. This port just it's the dropped. second best one, yeah. Death, What's, death. Hollow Knight. Oh, Hollow Knight. <laughs> yeah, I knew it. Um, Hollow Knight's too hard. This is hard, but not as hard as. I agree. Knight. I agree. And it's also oh, it's, it's brutal. It, it is, but you can you can drop it down to easy and stuff like that, and it's it's easy to grind and sort of like upgrade your weird health balls or whatever they're called. Um, um, I drop that down then. Yeah, it's a. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful games of the of this generation, and it's also one of those like really cool things that this was an Xbox exclusive game, and they brought it over to. Switch, now that and it is buds. yeah, not yeah. the not the friends, and it is like perfectly. It is a perfect port. Like there is the, the frame rate is amazing. The the resolution and graphics are amazing. It is like a beautiful, fun, awesome two D game. I've been playing it on Switch Lite, um, and it's just fantastic. It's just a really beautiful, smart Metroidvania. You're sort of. Your verticality and movement in this game is like really w welcome after playing some slightly more cumbersome uh, Metroidvania games. Mm -hmm. It's it's all about movement. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, I would I would echo this that uh, I haven't played it on Switch yet, but Ori and the Blind Forest is one of the best modern Metroidvanias, hands down. Yeah, yeah. it's just so, really amazing. I'm so interested to, to see some figures out of Ori and the Blind Forest on Switch because mm -hmm. I feel like it's such a better uh, fit for the Switch than yep. it was for the Xbox. And mm -hmm. I feel like it maybe not necessarily got overlooked as an Xbox exclusive, but I don't think it yeah. was It's as, one of the best yeah. games I feel like I've played in this generation. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. I love that, like, the way the combat functions. It is, like, very, like, quick and fluid in its movement, but, like, the way you can... You have, like, this ability where you can kind of, like... And, you know, maybe you guys can clarify. You can kind of hone in on, like, an attack and then redirect it. So yep. kind of, like, yep. that that quick pause that you have gives you extra time to think, which I really appreciate. Um, and it helps make the difficulty a little bit more manageable because mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like you're constant. Like, you are constantly going, but you have a few moments to catch your breath. There's so many, like, 
beautifully orchestrated moments in that game, like uh, so, sort of early on, and Brian, I don't know if you're at this point yet, but where um, there's, it's kind of flooding and you're going oh, vertically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like one of my favorite gaming moments in recent years. A ginkgo like, tree. Yes, yeah, it no, was it reminded so, me of so, like... And it ends so cinematically and beautifully. Yeah. And it reminded me of like the end of Metroid else. where yeah. you're like going up the... Well, it's also like it, this game does such a good job of uh, platforming. Yes. Like it, it actually... The Amazing. way the platforming scales in this game is like it gets it gets like guacamole difficult. You know, cool. like towards the end of that game. Um, I keep hitting stuff and knocking stuff over. You do. But yeah, well, you got me shoved in the little corner over here, my little box. Uh, no, it's, it's... You said to, you were down to sit there. So. I know. It's cool. Um, so please play this game if you're a Nintendo fan, if you love Metroidvania games, if you love platformers, yeah. if you love beautiful games. I would say even if you don't like Metroidvania, still play it because even though it is a Metroidvania, it doesn't feel as... I got here, but clearly I need to go back. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. feel as heavy handed as other Metroidvanias in my opinion. Like it feels a lot more like seamless than that. So even if you don't like Metroidvanias, if you like platformers, you need to play this game because it's so good. Yep. Janet, do you have anything you've Sweet. been playing that you want yeah. to shout out real quick? Super, super fast. I'm still playing Link's Awakening. I'm only through the third dungeon so far. Not super hot on it. I've talked about that a bit on Twitter, but a lot of people in the office say that after the third dungeon, it really starts to like pick up and get better. Which so, game? So Link's Awakening. Oh. Yeah, so I'm going to definitely finish it. That's my goal to finish it this month, and we'll see how I uh, grow to like it. Uh, basically, my big complaints are some elements are cumbersome, which I think people, if you're playing it, kind of get what I mean yep. in terms of abilities. But uh, the thing I really like about it, besides the art style, is how weird it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm constantly, I didn't play the original, so I'm like constantly surprised by like the things you can do. And I think given when it came out, it just makes that even more impressive like narratively. So I do appreciate that aspect of it. Uh, also playing Kirby's Dream Course because I am a terrible person who did not play in the SNES games when they first came out. That's okay. Even though I was like, I want this. And then I'm like, oh, I have it. All right, I'm going to do other stuff. But so that's, that's the great thing about them yeah. is that they're here for you whenever you want them. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> I'm playing Kirby's Dream Course, uh, which a lot of people say is great. I've been enjoying it. I've been using that rewind function like nobody's business. I cannot set up my shots in Kirby's Dream Course. <laughs> I suck at Kirby's Dream Course, and it's fine because you can just rewind it and reset it up. So it's like eight uh, courses, eight like le not levels, but like I don't know, golf, like eight holes. Holes, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, no, what, that's the. What are you I, doing, right? Eight holes. I hate yeah. that I had to say that word in isolation, but that's exactly the term for it. eight courses, Clip eight it. holes. Holes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Great movie, great book, but yeah. And then uh, lastly, I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> lastly, I'm playing. Um, shout out the Sheila Booth movie Holes. Shout out the Holes. Hell yeah, yeah. That's a that's Hell a Disney yeah. Channel exclusive. Um, I'm also playing uh, on Apple Arcade. Oh my god, I'm crying because that was so funny. Apple Arcade. I'm playing Grindstone. Grindstone's awesome. It's a match puzzle game where you're basically essentially matching like colors of enemies and striking through them. Uh, that sounds very simplistic and kind of like, oh, sounds like a real other match game. But the way the enemies build and the challenges and environments differentiate over time makes it super compelling. It's one of the most, like some of the most fun I've had with a game like in the last month or two. It's been awesome. Get Apple Arcade. Apple Arcade has a bunch of great games. It's dope. There's not many. There are a lot of people in the office who have been saying that Grindstone is one of the best games they've played all year. Yeah. I would say that it's one of the best games I've played all year. It's awesome. I want it on Switch. Okay. The developer is cap Cappy. Yeah. So was it not coming to Switch? I mean, so this is a thing. Oh, is, you know what? I'm thinking of what the golf. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Apple Arcade has the games are exclusive on mobile mm -hmm. to Apple games or to Apple to iOS. They yeah. just can't go to Android, but they can come to any other platform. So Grindstone could make its way to Switch eventually. I think it would be a great fit for it. I, I really Switch would like to see game. that game on there. Cool. I agree. Uh, we are just about out of time, but I did want to take Ooh. one question from the fans uh, in a little game we like to play called Question Block. Because if was here, he would say that it wasn't a game. Well, he's not, so he's Well, not. I'm here, so game of the year. There you go. <laughs> Uh, th this is just a really good question that we got from the Facebook group. I put up a very, very quick po uh, post asking for questions. If you would like to contribute questions next time, uh, you can always go to the Nintendo Voice Chat Facebook forums and join us there. It's a nice little community. We post things. We ask for your questions. So what this comes from them. Uh, it's from Luis Martinez, uh, and it's a really interesting question that I like a lot. Futuristic Zelda or medieval Metroid? Which would you want? Futuristic Zelda. I don't want either. Because um, <laughs> that's not an this option, a hypothetical Brian. World. It right. is a yeah. binary. You get Futuristic Zelda Which is the medieval least Metroid. bad. <laughs> futuristic Zelda, because Zelda uh, as a series, I feel like has more variety in 
its lore and design than Metroid does. Like Metroid, it's like you're and you guys, you're like still, you're a hero versus you're a bounty hunter. But like Metroid's a lot more like small in its lore scope. Like with Zelda, it it kind of reminds scope. me of like yeah, <laughs> lore scope. <laughs> Not to be confused with Game Scoop, uh-huh. you know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, with Zelda, like it can kind of be anything. And we've seen like Zelda games be so different throughout like time. So I feel like a futuristic Zelda would be less weird i mean he had he had an method. ipad in the last game yeah, yeah. You know? well that's what like, i was gonna say is it's, i like it's, it's doable i like futuristic zelda too because he also had a motorcycle he had motorcycle <laughs> he, had a, he had a laser like laser swords yeah. right he had yeah, the enemies shot lasers at you yeah i i think that there's a way a that phone. you could make zelda futuristic <laughs> and it would still totally feel like zelda whereas i i think if you took metroid and made it a medieval game it would lose a lot of its soul. I, I, I don't know. Like, what would you I have Samus like, shooting a bow? I also, right? She doesn't have a ship. She just has, like, a horse. But I also yeah. feel like there's, there's a dozen games that are already medieval Metroid. Like, Castlevania Symphony of the Night is right. medieval yeah. Metroid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, essentially. But, like, Hollow Knight is medieval Metroid. Like, I, I, I don't know. With I, bugs. I, with bugs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, I, I uh, agree. I think that I think it's... We, we've got a lot of the other one already. What's the game? Dead Cells. Yeah. Right? Like, that's another example of a game that is, like, old-timey... Metroid essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think Zelda could keep its soul going into the futuristic setting and I think Metroid would potentially there was, yeah, muddled. There was concept art. I think it was around Twilight Princess about a futuristic Zelda that l- looked super cool and I've always had it in the back of my head. But I also feel like Brian is kind of right. Like they kind of already did that with Breath of the Wild uh, including a lot of these like Breath of the Wild 2 elements. more f- even further into the future. <laughs> yeah. Set it in the 80s. <laughs> more technologically advanced. iPad Pro. I think the other thing too really quick like with Metroid I think a lot of us are defaulting to like Metroid as in Metroidvania but like I think a lot of other things make a Metroid game a Metroid game. Yeah, like same as the, yeah, exactly. The the gun, the mor- the morph ball. Like, are you gonna just morph into I don't know, like a less technologically advanced? You're just getting a cart. Fox you just you just roll. You you're way. actually not in a ball. You're just like really <laughs> tiny and just slowly rolling away. Um, so yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you for that question, Lewis. Uh, if you guys have any other questions for us, again, Facebook forums for NBC. <laughs> Uh, we also you can also email at us anytime at nvc at ign.com. Thank you again uh, to Logan Plant, our NVC assistant, for helping out with the show. As always, we love you very much. Uh, you can catch NVC every Thursday, 3 p.m. on ign.com, on the IGN or the Nintendo Voice Chat YouTube channel, mm-hmm. any podcasting service you want. Uh, friends, where can they find you? Oh, you can find me on Twitter at Game Onesis and also Instagram and Facebook at Game Onesis. Brian? I'm on Twitter at Agent Bizzle and I'm on Instagram at Brian Altano. And Zach? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Zacharias D, and I'm on Instagram at maybe Zachary underscore D. I can't remember. I never remember my Instagram handle. Don't follow him on Instagram. That's, That's what fine. he's saying. My yeah. name is Tom Marks, and I am on Twitter at, uh, at Tom R. Marks. Of course, our normal host, Casey, uh, will not be back next week, but she will be back at some point in the future. She's just very busy right now doing lots of very fun stuff, which she will bring to you on IGN.com, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, until then... We will see you next time. And remember, this is the only place where you can get the thing. Get the thing.